Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive. Uh, you know all that entertain, educate, and inspire stuff. If it is your first time to the channel, do please consider subscribing. Let's see if we can't get that focused in on because we do a lot of primitive build and hunt videos, how to's, tutorials, all that kind of stuff. So hang with us. Today we're going to work on making that point right there. Now I'll show it to you again. That is a classic. Boy, the camera wants to be different. There we go. That is a classic Cahokia point. Now, believe it or not, that is a cast of an original artifact out of the Cahokia Mountains. That's not a recreation. That is a cast of an original. Very, very small. I've made several of these. I'm now actually offering these on my site, but they are a very uh, finely curated point. So we put a little bit more time into these, and we've get, we get some phenomenal edge geometry, phenomenal tip geometry, nice uh, notchings in this thing. It's a small point, but it's exceptionally deadly. So we're going to make one today. And we have some new tools for the lineup, as well as uh, some new techniques to introduce you to. So as usual, I'll kind of walk through and show you some of the tools that I'm working with today. And we're still working with copper. And I know we got probably some folks saying, man, I wish he would get back to doing some of the antler stuff. Hang on, because as I'm doing these, these flint napping videos, we started all the way back at the beginning and starting with flint napping for beginners and I'll put a link down in the description to that one you should check it out if you've not seen that one that is like the one to get started with and I show you all these tools that I'm working with but different sized copper boppers wood handled with uh, copper tip pressure flakers and of course my my little tiny freehand bopper which is I call the little rascal. Some people seem to like that. And of course the abrader and my leather pad. Now I do have another one that I'm going to introduce you to and that is the little, it's basically the little rascal version of the pressure flaker. And so this is a very very small steel nail tipped. Come on camera work with me here. Just doesn't want to work. Hold on. Now it should work. Steel nail tipped pressure flaker. Now this isn't something that we can just use to hog stuff out. This is very very fine 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 work and you have to have it very thin fine point for this to make any sense at all. And if you've heard me talking on social media at all about something else I have interesting to show you it is this. And most people would say oh that's an Ishii stick I understand how that works but I don't use it that way. I use it with indirect percussion and yes, I will show you more about that probably in another video. And also, as we get further into this, I'm going to start introducing more and more antler and stone tools back into this. So, of course, this is kind of like a from the beginning moving on to more advanced stuff with flint napping. But right now we're still on copper. And this stuff, this new stuff here, obviously the other, um, the other flint napping tools are on my website the little nail tip flaker and the indirect percussion stick are also available on huntprimitive.com but I'll tell you the same exact thing that I told you about the other kits I don't care if you buy them from me or from somebody else I like to use wood handles on on stuff like that I like the feel of wood I don't make a living selling tools I sell I make a living essentially selling finished product but I like to offer the tools to people so they can just say I want the same exact ones I know they work that Ryan Gill used in the video so if you want to head to huntprimitive.com you can find this stuff too and soon teaser or spoiler alert they'll probably be due to popular nagging the crap out of me um, we'll probably start doing some antler tools and stuff on the website too don't hold me to it but that's probably gonna happen so anyway all that out of the way let's move on to the build now I had a nice piece of rock there it is and we're gonna turn some spotlights on and we're gonna get into the camera and if traditionally your Cahokias are gonna be made from Burlington and there's multiple different strains of Burlington chert um, I also will be making some out of Edwards chert to offer on my site for people that don't like the white color is one better than the other absolutely not They'll both kill deer just as dead. One's not really stronger than the other. At the end of the day, it's pretty much just a color preference with the most traditional color being typically a white shirt of some point. So, 
let's uh, throw some spotlights on, move you in close, and let's get this point made. Here's a piece of rock we're going to work with. We'll start off getting a braider, pressure flaker, and we're going to start off with the medium billet that we normally use. I'm not going to run into the big billet right now because it is uh, bigger than we need for this little piece of rock. So let's go ahead and work through. Now, if you want the deep, down, dirty explanation of why I'm hitting rocks where, uh, how I'm breaking stuff off. I'm not going to be going through, I'm not drawing this one out into a two hour long instructional video on it. I'm definitely going to give you some tips as I come along and show you some highlights, but the flint napping for beginners video is really going to be the one that you want to check out. So again, go back and check that out in uh, the link in the description. Hold on, I am going to adjust the light here a second. I think that's a little bit better. <clears throat> so, I'm just kind of walk you through, smacking a couple pieces off, because I know what you really want to see is you want to see that new indirect percussion method, and then also that little precision flaker and uh, notcher and sharpening tool, right? So, let's go ahead and work through this. What I'm doing is I'm just doing the drastic thinning, driving flakes well across center with little to no regard if I break the piece. If I break it, I'll grab another one. It's not the end of the world. But as we get closer and put more time into it, then obviously that's when I really don't want to break it. And I start being a little bit more careful. Now, getting pretty close to switching tools that should work then what we'll do is I I'm very progressional and working through different sizes of tools and the reason that I went with the indirect stick that you're gonna see soon is because there's a weird gap between using the freehand uh, billet work like this and getting too thin and then breaking the point so I think I actually did that in that last video in that basics of flint napping video or the beginners flint napping video and so I started adopting that method and again I'll show you that in a minute and then I'll probably do a whole video just kind of on that in the future but more with aboriginal tools because I want you to have a, a better understanding of it perfect Blew a nice piece off there. It's a nice one. Mm. Perfect, perfect, perfect. A little bit more. The free hand. That is probably as far as we're going to take that one before we get too pushy with it. Have to put too much power in it. So that's the stage we're at right now. Okay? It's by faced out pretty good. It's not terribly thin. It's thin enough. But <clears throat> now I'm going to switch the camera around because we're going to use this tool. I'm going to back it up here a second and show you how I'm using this tool. None of the spotlights make it look funny. Now, traditionally, I'm going to show you this later on, that they obviously wouldn't have been sitting in a chair while they were doing this. Now, this is, a, this is an ancient technology. It's new to me. But it goes up under your knee. Now, I think there have undoubtedly been several people that are flint nappers on YouTube that have probably done this. I like would guarantee it. I would say folks like... Uh, Flit Napping Tips, Marty Reuter, or Jack Crafty, um, Shooters More, I'm just drawing a blank right now, have done this. I picked this tip up from a friend of mine, Ryland Birch, at the Silver River Nap-In, and he told me he picked it up from somewhere else. And of course, that's how all this stuff works, right, is you get, you pass along information. And I typically absorb information in a very organic way. I like to see it in person, rather than looking for it on a video. And 
Uh, I watched him do it, and I really was intrigued by the whole holding the stick up under your knee. So, I mean, I'm closing my knee tight. Right now, I'm using an ammo can to put my foot on, but I can actually crouch down like this, like I'm sitting like this on the ground, and hold this and net points with it. And I really look forward to showing you that, because in the future, not today, with the Aboriginal tools, because it's really neat watching the progression of a, of a point being made doing that. So, of course... If you're not subscribed and have, don't have that like notification bell that YouTube wants to do now, um, if you're not signed up for all that, do that if you don't want to miss that abo napping video that will be coming soon. So, now you can see what's going on here, and this is just a wood mallet. You could use an antler mallet. I've seen all kinds of mallets used. That's not the important part. The important part is this hardwood stick with a quarter inch cold rolled copper rod put into the middle and now this is you know and it's not it's not a dowel rod because you'll break a dowel rod in about one hit because the grain run out this is a, a stick of hardwood this one happens to be sparkleberry that's what I like to make them out of and you will actually may even notice when we're up close you'll see some cracks in here that's because I beat this thing pretty hard but I come back here and that's all wrapped with sinew and that's what keeps it from from blowing out and I have yet to actually break one doing that. But the idea with, with this indirect, and I'll show you an up close here soon, is you're putting the tip right where you want to remove the flake. Now it's kind of weird because some of your angle changes, or some of your angles are different. This definitely changes versus the percussion napping. So you have to tinker with it a little bit and figure out, because you're not putting it straight against, against it like pressure flaking and then rocking it, you're actually sitting it on top of the the flake you want to remove so I'll show you that again up here close but once you find the angles that you want then you hold it there I actually like to pick up on the rock to just put some preloaded pressure just so it's not wandering around and then I can hit it and drive these incredibly long flakes across this so I know you're dying to see more of this because I've been talking about it so let me go ahead and yank the camera up we'll get a couple up close shots of this Okay, <clears throat> I'm thinking at this point my my crotch is probably getting really famous on YouTube here lately um, from all these lovely close-up camera angles. And of course, I'm uh, got my customary uh, napping lubrication. I gotta take a sip once in a while. So. I'm going to braid off like we normally would in the base. The, the, the same principles of flint napping uh, exist here. What you're doing is you're trying to build platforms off one side and then remove flakes. But what I've found by being able to do this is it decreases the shock in the piece. And so it's also very, very accurate. So people that really struggle with the accuracy of, of freehand... Um, percussion napping can use something like this and remove really really good flakes and so again let's go ahead and show you that some more now I don't know if you can really see the amount of uh, flakes that are popping off of this because they are really flying off. In fact, I want to make sure I really get this in focus for you, so we'll switch it to manual. That should work, I think. And it's raining out, so now it's extra noisy on the tin roof. But we're going to find these platforms, hold it up, and knock it off. Now, I did drive one there that was fairly long. It's still thin, you can see, but it's all the way back to here. Sometimes you can get some really big flakes. I almost like to take really long little flakes so I can be really controlled with it. But you're going to see at some point what's going to happen is if I get some sort of turtle back or something like that, I can line out and really drive that, that flake off with this indirect. So that's a good example there. That one, again, it usually blows. It's like paper thin little little pieces and it just blows usually them right off and it's hard to even see them that was a good one sounded good there 
There we go. Now, I've, like I said, I've been able to get much more uh, accurate hits. And I can remove flakes like this all the way to center. Let me grab a tool here and show you. Oh, I'm falling over in my seat. You can see I've removed this whole nice little turtle back that was right there in the middle of it. And that would be a lot more difficult to do with a direct percussion. So, again, kind of new to me information. It's obviously been around for a very long time. But this is just me passing on the knowledge to you. So hopefully you can implement this, whether you want to build your own indirect stick or if you want to pick one up from me or somebody else doesn't matter I'm not concerned about that in the least I just want to see you trying new things and having a good time and I do want to give out a little uh, a shout out to uh, Marty Ruder been kind of talking to him a little bit recently hoping to get him to help out with some of our future projects because he is a, a very very a uh, skilled and knowledgeable flint napper and you can find him at flint napping tips on YouTube so do please go check him out so braiding off now the problem with doing this is it's a much slower process overall than simply normal direct percussion or pressure flaking but to me the results are worth the extra time now when it comes down to making some of these points now I may use this don't get me wrong I've been really enjoying this a lot but I don't just exclusively use it now but I mix it into my bag of tricks while I'm making other points and what it's allowed me to do is actually get to be a better and better napper, which of course is always the goal. But now what it's also allowed me to do is create points better than I think I've ever made before because instead of now getting to a point where I'm a little bit scared of of breaking one, trying to get a perfect little piece off in the middle or, or whatever and I don't want to hit it anymore, and I say that's good enough, now I can pick this up and with fairly little fear I can really drive a big beautiful flake across center that one obviously did hinge on me there a little bit you can see right there but that's fine not even worried about it because when I build it up this side I'll drive it back over it's a such a forgiving method of napping and it does take a little bit of time to get used to it see I drove that one all the way actually up and over so it's definitely worth checking out and then People will inevitably and unfortunately get onto my website and see that my normal stone point prices are the same, but I am offering these new Cahokia points. I call them classic Cahokias because they're true to size. They're not the oversized built versions that I and even other people used to do. They're historically accurately sized and shaped, and they're phenomenal hunting points. But they are more expensive, but the reason is, is because it's taking a fair amount more time to nap these points with this new method and using indirect, but we're making them so much better. So if people really like them and they don't mind paying the little extra for them, I'm perfectly okay with that. And if they don't, my other points are still available and I've been killing deer with them now for well over a decade and have killed a lot of animals with them as, as have other people killed a lot of animals with my points so you can still use those but if you're like me and you're a perfectionist and you want the best of the best you can find these ones on my website as well so almost <clears throat> Getting a good drive there, yeah. Now this is something that I wouldn't normally do in the past. You can see there's, I know those new spotlights I got are great for seeing stuff, but at the same time they they can make it difficult on camera. 
but I'm getting old eyes, so I kind of need to see better. These, I got a couple little step fractures right there. I don't know if you can really see those or not. Have a look. I think you can. And normally, if I try to pressure flake through those, they just continue to hinge and get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And it just aggravates you to no end. And so now what I do is I just build up a little stiffer platform like I would normally to take um, and percussion nap those off. And now I'm actually going to grind them off really good. But if I percussion nap these, so many times I've broken the piece because of the shock from hitting it. Now I'm not saying you'll never break a piece with indirect, but my break ratio has really gone down a lot since using this. And right, well, almost there. That was it. Got a good piece of it anyway. Didn't get it all, but I can come back and braid it off and do it again. So this has really been a game changer. There we go. This has really been a game changer in my napping that I can grab a hold of these flakes and I mean really drive stuff across center. I've actually got to the point where sometimes late in the evening I've been excited with the idea of seeing how far I can take this and my goodness I have got some absolutely beautifully thin pieces but I've also pushed it to the point where they are so thin that they're almost not practical and then as I keep pushing keep pushing keep pushing they eventually I do will eventually break them I mean you just can't keep driving stuff across center without eventually breaking but it is unbelievable and I'm so looking forward to showing you a video of doing like a larger archaic point like an archaic atlatl point, like a Paternalis or a Dalton or, you know, something along those lines, and using the indirect and showing you how phenomenally thin we can actually get it with indirect percussion. So, although it's, uh, it is old, certainly old technology, but whoever in the most recent of times really came up with this again man I really thank them and I, like everything else I'm always kind of sad that I, I jump on the ship a little bit late realistically I know I'm a pretty good flint napper and I make a heck of a lot of points that I hunt with and kill game with but as far as like artistic flint napping or general skills even flint napping like I'm very specialized like I'm good at my knife blades and I'm good at you know the very specific points that I make but sometimes like this these overall flint napping guys uh, another name that comes to mind is Justin Cook a good friend of mine and I mean just a phenomenal flint napper I'm acutely aware that I am spread very very thin between making bows arrows atlatls flint napping stone knives running a business having a family planning hunting trips, filming, editing, all that stuff, I'm spread so thin that I truly don't have the time to really allocate to learning some of the the greater skill that some of these other flit nappers do. That that's that's pretty much like their their number one is sitting down and flint napping and learning new techniques. And they're very, very good at what they do and I'm obviously I'm not afraid to say, hey, you know, teach me or follow this guy because he really knows what he's talking about because in the in the world of flint nappers I'm really probably not not that good I would say I'm certainly better than average and I make some stuff that's very specialized you know like these Cahokia points or my normal hunting points where I've got sharpening down really really good I mean I've got some some of these guys are really curious as to how I'm able to get a point so sharp but it's like well that's that's been one of my number one goals so I've dedicated the time just like some of them have dedicated the time to learning, you know, how to how to flute a fulsome really, really well, or how to uh, how to thin an archaic piece where the flakes go from one side to another, because that was their number one goal. So, hoping that this is a a little lesson for everybody that not everybody, not one person can know it all. That we're much stronger flitnappers and anything we do in life, really, if 
we're willing to admit that we don't know everything about everything and ask others for help. Because if we share knowledge, we're all going to be much better because of it. Oh man, that is beautiful. So I want you to really see, look how thin that we're getting this. It's crazy thin. And it, like I need to stop because it's that thin. It's ridiculous. So, go ahead and start pressure flaking off the back of this and actually kind of have to be a little bit careful at times because we are just getting so incredibly thin. But, yeah, and this, notice I can just sit here with this hanging out. So as I'm making points, it's not a big deal for this to just exist here. And then as I, if I need it, I don't have to just pick up a new tool and, you know, and this thing too is when you get to some of these backsides that are a little bit thicker and they're arguing with you, this is another way that's, that's really fairly safe to thin those bases without running that shock wave up. Now I already know what you're saying, holy cow. Can you flute with that? And the answer is absolutely yes. And I've done it, and I've been so impressed with my fluting ability after using this tool. So, of course, give me a little bit of time to put it all together, but I'll do a video on that, on how I'm fluting stuff. So, this is why I'm saying, if you love this stuff, you love sitting through it, make sure you're subscribed and put on that notification bell because I have no way of just like reaching out and saying hey I've got a new video that you're gonna watch but I know for the most part most of you that are watching right now have been some serious faithful followers that are interested in sitting through my hour-long videos and learning how to do stuff and watching my progression with it, quite honestly. I mean, shoot, yes, I'm a professional, but I'm I'm learning almost every day something. It's just, it's unbelievable how my thirst for knowledge can never be quenched. And uh, I always want to learn as much as I can and better myself. And sometimes I don't know what direction that's going to come from, but as long as I have an open mind, I'm sure it'll find me. So anyway, now we're just working through the final pressure flake and in fact I don't even think I need the indirect anymore but man you can just see how beautifully thin we got that piece but I lied I, I am probably gonna build up a platform and drive just a little bit more hopefully I don't take it too far I don't need to but that's what I'm talking about with with working with these these really finely detailed points and that's again that's why they're a little more expensive on my website this version is because where normally I would notch this and I would say that's good I got to where it's really super thin up here but you can see it's a little bit thicker back here and so we're going through and working on making these the absolute best that they can be it might be a little bit overkill you know like I said I've been killing deer there's the rain I've been killing deer with stuff that's not as refined but sometimes it's like if you can make your point even 3% better, why won't you? So we're almost there. All right, hopefully that we spared you some of the final cleanup with it, but we're just down to a triangle. And now I've got my little steel tipped flaker it's very very fine like I said this isn't something that you can drive big flakes off with this is tiny little tick 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 pieces if you try to use this it doesn't bite as hard as uh, the copper does and it's very very thin now if you're used to use used to seeing me using and, and especially in the last video that flattened out piece of copper that I use as a notching flaker that is really good but when you get down to something that's really really thin you can overpower and break it and so that's why I've kind of found it's it's kind of almost hard to overpower this and that's why I really like this now plus I can get a little bit finer of a line with it but don't just abandon the regular notching flaker and say well I'm gonna get one of these because if you have a thicker piece especially a, a larger outlatal point or a thicker arrowhead that you haven't been able to get super thin you really need that notching flaker because if you have a twist you're just gonna keep slipping off of it this is teeny tiny little work is really what this is. 
flip it over. And it's the same thing where if you watched my notching thing in the beginner, I'm not just doing, this is exaggerated, but I do a flake this way on the inside of the notch and then one this way. And so it's tiny because what I'm trying to do is almost create a little nipple on the middle. So if I get into a bad situation where it hangs up on me, I can go take that little nipple off and it gives me a beautiful fresh platform to hit because that happens more times than not. Now, this is again not a tool that you want to put a lot of force into. It's like you almost have to walk around and find the spot that wants to come off. And don't be in a rush to just cram, whoops, cram through the notch. If you're looking for little notches. If you're looking for a big notch or you don't really care, go for it. I'm not a notching master, I'll tell you that much right now. As far as I see people that, you know, use modern tools and, I mean, they're running, they're running things as deep as this whole uh, flaker is. But that's not really my speed. I'm more of a functionality kind of guy. But I do like some thin notches, especially on a tiny little point like this. So it doesn't have as much bite as the copper. So you don't want to force it. What you're trying to do is really grab onto these, I mean, teeny tiny little platforms. And it just takes some patience. So the flakes I'm removing are silly small. If you can see that. And it's... Sometimes it's almost even like dust when it comes off because they break into several pieces. But I can just keep working around either back and forth or in a semicircle to get those flakes where I want them to go. So this is all very patient work. This is why if you if you're trying to do stuff that's a little bit more detailed like this, it just takes time. So it's kind of it's kind of delicate work and that's that's again the beauty of this little flaker is it won't remove the great big pieces so it almost as long as you don't like really abuse it it kind of keeps you from making any great big mistakes now you can see what I just did I don't know if you caught that or not but I really got to a point where it stopped going in and you know we all like these little thin notches but at the end of the day sometimes you can expand it out a little bit and give yourself a bigger platform and although it's you know maybe in the the artistic side of flint napping that's kind of a failure on it of course of course you know a lot of those guys are using cut and ground preforms man it rains noisy I'm sorry about that but when we're looking for a functional point the functional notch sometimes it doesn't hurt to just take a little bit more out all right, let me finish this notch. I'm gonna wait till this rain stops screaming at us. So maybe you can hear me talk some more. So anyway, there you go, that's one, one notch is done. I'll just go ahead and work on the other one, but I'll time lapse through it so you don't have to listen to either me ramble or the rain beat down on the roof. The, the right little platforms that's how fast some of the notches can be some of them can I mean really just take a long time without trying to mess it up like this one but sometimes if you make them just that tiny bit wider <laughs> they're a heck of a lot easier to put in so I would say we're pretty good there for notching all right so let's let the the rain die down we'll sharpen up actually I lied the Cahokias have a little basil notch, which I'm not a hundred percent sure of the reason, although I have a very good theory, and that is uh, maybe somebody else will key in with an idea and say, "Oh, that, yeah, I didn't think about that." But on the same idea of how I half some of my Dalton points, where in the half I'm using like a flake to eat it out, and so it's got a ridge in the center that perhaps that ridge it's easier to actually flake just a tiny bit of stone out than it is to try to eat the wood out in the end of your arrow shaft. 
or the cane out for that matter if you're using a four shaft or what so kind of interesting stuff to think about and I did kind of blow the back notch out a little bit and made it I was too busy talking I didn't make it as thin as I could have but I'm doing a a fun mixture of trying to make it good look good and um, there we go a little bit wider notches than I normally shoot for but that's really no big deal at all and actually coincidentally the rain just started quieting down so let's go ahead and sharpen it so if you see me sharpen before we're looking for teeny tiny individual clicks And these ones, I'm going to use this flaker, and almost, I mean really what you're looking for is your serrations need to need to be one click, and I'm, by, I'm doing my serrations about as far apart as the width of the flaker. In fact, at this point, what I might actually do is go through and refine that edge in a second. I'll do the same to match it on this side. I'll do it, I'll refine the edge of my flaker after notching. And that should give me a little finer serrations yet. So if you're trying to do a little fine work and get these micro serrations just right, take oh, five or so minutes, take a file, and sharpen your tools up. So that's what I'm going to do right now. You don't need to sit and watch the whole thing, but I've got a of a little file and I'm just gonna set the point up where it's safely out of harm's way and I'm just gonna sharpen this like this over and over and over until I have a nice needle sharp tip. Alright we're back and we're pretty sharp so now we're gonna go back through these serrations again very very carefully the idea is one tiny click I want to remove a lot of material, but with the material I do remove, I mean, these are some teeny tiny little flakes, if you can see those. Okay, that's what I'm looking for, but they're clean. They're not, I'm not grinding, I'm not chattering. It's one tick. You can hear that. That's what's going to make a point scary sharp. I've spent years and years and years getting a feel for putting a really sharp edge on stone. And so, see if you can see that edge right there, how sharp that one is. Very, very, very sharp. And it's teeny, teeny, tiny serrations, which normally I don't do my serrations that small, but some of the work on these Cahokias is really, really small. Now, I am also a believer that some bigger serrations, not gigantic, but some bigger serrations do have more devastating effects on animals. However, I've also been doing some testing with some of our other small points in our small points, Scalorn and uh, Hamilton, Madison uh, projects. And I'm noticing that some of these little fine serrations are also doing just fine. So they they do allow for a little bit more penetration per se. It de it's relative, relative to the weight of the bow you're shooting. It's not drastic at all whatsoever. It's kind of a little bit of a trade-off. You might be able to get away with a little bit lighter of a bow with these smaller serrations, you know, or a little bit slower of a bow because there's a little less resistance, but they're also not grabbing that flesh, pulling it, tearing it, cutting it, ripping it out the other side, causing massive hemorrhage. Now these things are, again, still, even though the serrations are very small, they are still very, very, very sharp. And it's kind of the best of both worlds when you're talking about doing these little micro serrations on a small point that's, you know, maybe just seven eighths wide, so it's legal. There's no barbed ends. So, this is probably the, for states that allow stone point huntings, this is about as most legal as it gets and still the most deadly that it can possibly be. Because you can see in this, and I know it's leaning back a little bit through the 
tip geometry there's no roundness to the tip at all it is it is come straight to a needle and then the width of this point is pretty thin and of course you don't want it so paper thin that it breaks on impact but it's pretty darn thin and it continues to taper even more so into here so it's not parallel and then all of a sudden has a point on it it tapers this way as well so it tapers both ways and that's how you're gonna have proper tip geometry and then the edge geometry is that you have this great very fine long elliptical cross section through here as opposed to just a flat point that has like this little beveling sharpened on the edge so that's a difference in making a really super super sharp point now this one is right where it needs to be it is it's grabbing my skin I don't know if you can even see that it's it's pulling my skin like it's grabbing it and I'm barely touching it now the tip what I want to do the tip is really good on this already but I mean I am gonna do the finest little flake removal and I'm gonna make sure that there's no this one's really really good actually that there's no little burrs or micro turtle backs on the back of the tip or anything like that. In fact, I'm going to come through and even clean up that that edge just a little bit better in there because I can always make it the best it can possibly be. Then what we'll do is we're going to take our abrader. The abrader is actually a little bit severe for this. I'll, I'm just going to, and I'm what I'm doing is just like the last eighth of an inch. I'm kind of grinding it off and making more of a point. Now the reason for that is the, and then I got like a polishing stone. The reason for doing this and putting in this extra time, that's what makes this stuff the best of the best of the best. And we're not obviously doing the whole edge, okay? We're just doing the very tippy tip because it's the same idea as a braiding um, a side of a rock. You're going to strengthen the platform so you can drive a flake further. Well in this instance we're not trying to drive a flake further. What we're doing is straightening or strengthening all the little tiny micro platforms along the edge so the tip doesn't break as easily if that makes sense. So we're strengthening it by removing the little piddly crummy um, platforms and then if you need to come in and remove you don't want to push hard at all like I mean this is a slight this is stuff I wouldn't even do with the copper with antler I normally don't go that crazy with it but again if you're trying to be the best of the best and that's what I'm always looking at is saying how can I even if I use modern tools because it's kind of weird in a way because um, native peoples when they got a hold later in time of certain metals they wow that is really sharp they certainly used them for stuff like this refining even more so I think we've got that ironed out that tip I mean I cannot get that any sharper so what I'm gonna do is just buff that edge down a little bit I got I mean maybe one tiny micro flake I could take but at this point that's really silly to do that so there it is, and you can see how, what I'll also do is, I'll take the abrader just back here where it's going to have to, I'm going to just dull that a little bit because I don't want that to be too intense. Thanks for following along, I hope you really enjoyed this, I mean, what an absolute tiny, tiny, incredibly deadly and sharp. Very, oh man, crazy sharp little point. It doesn't it doesn't have that huge slice ability of the oh it does <laughs> of the uh, big serrations, but it's pretty darn sharp. So make sure you're subscribing, following along. Of course, these points and the tools we use to make them are available at huntprimitive.com, and I appreciate you following along.